Hello, and welcome to my program, Elderhood, Aging Gracefully. My name is Larry Grimm, and I'm privileged to welcome to you, welcome you to uh, our Think Tech studio, and the opportunity to think about aging gracefully with me and with my guest, Jay Fidel. We'll turn to him in just a minute, but first of all, I'd like to do a quick review of this program and, and my ongoing program with Think Tech Hawaii. I have been a chaplain for two years here on, with uh, Bristol Hospice, Bristol Hospice Hawaii, and uh, I'm proud to be a part of a company that really leaves, lives its tagline, embracing a reverence for life. We serve <clears throat> families all over the island who have terminally ill patients in their homes and in facilities so that we can do a high quality of compassion and care for them. I'm also a, pro a professional uh, coach, life coach, personal life coach, specializing in elderhood. And I think of elderhood as something, a distinct uh, stage of our life. We had our childhood, we had adolescence, adulthood, and now we have elderhood. And when we think of it as a stage of life, there are those tasks that we need to do that come up before us and these tasks present themselves to us. And if we ignore them, I think we do so, we miss out on the value uh, that they can present us. But if we follow them, if we look at them and we, we uh, engage them, then we can make our life, our elderhood, really, really real and wonderful. Uh, these tasks are grieving, sorting out our stories, and we'll turn to that today. We did grieving last week, just touched on that. Sorting out our stories, forgiving, and that's not a religious compulsion, it's something that comes from within, preparing both externally and internally, and then finally letting go. And so my program here with Think Tank, Think Tech, <laughs> uh, is scheduled around and formed around those five spiritual tasks. And today we're looking at sorting out our stories, and I am very, very grateful and privileged to have as my guest the president and founder of Think Tech, of Think Tech Hawaii, Jay Fidel. Jay, thank you so much for being a part of my show. And how do you feel sitting in that chair instead of this one? I sit in this chair once in a while as a not a not a host, but a co-host or possibly a, a foil. <laughs> a foil, excellent. So you're right at home anywhere you are here. I am. That's great, Jay. Well, Jay, I uh, think Tech Hawaii has is in my estimation. Uh, of course, personally, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to partner with you in doing what we're doing with this show. But it's also such a gem to the intellectual community, both here in Hawaii and in the world, because we have people around the globe that are tuning in to these shows all, all the time. And you, you, this is a contribution that is really unparalleled in any place that I've ever seen. So what I wanted to know today, to start off with you is, as founder, is how did Think Tech Hawaii come about? What's the story of how it came about? Okay. Uh, how much time you got, Larry? <laughs> we got, oh, uh, <laughs> half an hour. <laughs> Short numbers. In 2001, in February, uh, an American nuclear submarine sank a Japanese uh, high school fishing uh, training vessel off Waikiki, the Ehemi Maru. Uh, the Greenville was the American uh, nuclear attack submarine. Mm. And, um, and since I had been in the service back when, back in the 60s and early 70s, uh, PBS called me and uh, asked me if I would cover that story for PBS. The story, namely the court of inquiry that followed the, the incident, the accident. And uh, so I got to meet some of the press. I got to meet, for example, I, I, a lot of people in the press because mm -hmm. there were hundreds of people came from all over the world to cover the story. Uh -huh. um, and um, one, of the, one of the people I met was from uh, Hawaii Public Radio. Uh -huh. So later on in that year, um, we established a radio show uh -huh. with our connection with the Hawaii Public Radio. And that, that lasted uh, eight years into the late uh, 2000s. And um, that was, it was a, a very stimulating experience to uh, cover the, the story and to report on it to the nation. I'm not kidding. Yeah. Uh, it was a heady experience. Uh, it went on for months, by the way, oh. uh, as long as the Court of Inquiry went on. Fascinating. Yeah. 
So uh, then thereafter, uh, we had a radio show about technology. That was our thing. We were driven off the Hawaii, uh, the uh, uh, Oboma, the Building Owners Association, Building Owners and Managers Association, because I was a lawyer serving that market. Okay. And I was the program chair there. And we sort of got into technology. And then ThinkTech was established in 2001, roughly. Um, and we started doing technology on Hawaii Public Radio. Um, and we had a weekly show on Wednesdays. It still exists. Our successor is still there. Oh. Uh, it's called Bite Marks Cafe now. Mm -hmm. uh, and we covered technology and related fields. And as time went by, we actually expanded beyond technology uh, and covered all kinds of stuff, uh, as broad as you could possibly imagine. 2008, we, we left there, and I started writing for the newspaper. We also did some uh, AM radio shows. And um, by about 2010, we had our own studio in the Davies Building down the block. Huh. Um, and then ultimately by 2000 and I want to say 12 or so, we, we uh, started a studio here in Pioneer Plaza. Wonderful. And that's all history. But you know, I went this afternoon, not, yeah. anticipating, not anticipating this discussion with you, but just as a matter of nostalgic curiosity, I went and looked at one of our shows from yeah. that time when we first started doing this kind of video. Yeah. And, you know, it was good. It was good. We Excellent. had green screen. We had good chroma key. We had good sound. Uh, we covered important things, and uh, we were articulate and helpful and all that stuff uh, you know, that you spoke of, trying to, um, you know, make a community contribution. So we've been doing it actively on video, I would say, since mm, radio before, but uh, video maybe since 2012 or so we really got started. Super, super. Yeah. What was the, what's the mission then? as you conceive of it. Of, well, it's, it's sort of like what you said. It's uh, raising public awareness. And, and more than that, we, we learned over time that we could provide a platform for citizen journalists uh, to come around and do shows. And so we have selected and uh, we have had a, a number, altogether hundreds of hosts from the community uh -huh. who come and do shows like you do. Super. Um, and they, they take the platform and they try to make, be part of making a, a community mm -hmm. contribution. And what military were you in? Coast Guard. Coast Guard, yeah, okay. Saving lives. Excellent. <laughs> Beautiful. Now, where did you grow up, Jay? New York. I grew up in uh, the borough of Queens. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I went to law school at NYU. I went to Queens College in Queens. Went to law school at NYU. And uh, I moved, uh, of course, to the law dormitories uh, in Greenwich Village in Manhattan. And so you started off in law. What was the story that you lived out? I, I maintain that we have stories <clears throat> that we tell ourselves about ourselves. And, and those stories really determine a lot of, well, they don't determine, but they become so much a part of the decision-making that we make about what we do, who we are. Um, <clears throat> so in that childhood, adolescence, into uh, young adulthood, everybody else is telling us who we are. Our parents. Our, our brothers and sisters, our uh, school teachers. Or fate. Say that again? Or fate. Or fate is telling fate. you. Fate. And sometimes we dig deep and we find the answer in our own selves. Well, and that's what happens in elderhood. But tell me about the story that you heard about. Okay, I went, to, I went to law school at NYU. Yeah. Um, uh, I finished in 1965. Um, thereafter, uh, I uh, was admitted to the tax school at NYU Law School, which is a very very elite tax school, and probably the best tax school in the country, mm. the, ta the law of taxation. Yeah, right. okay, and I started that in uh, September of 1965, right after I graduated from law school. Oh, so I was going to take that degree and become a tax lawyer. Um, but uh, a few days into September, I got a draft notice. Remember, uh, Vietnam was hot and heavy at the 65, time. 65, right. And Absolutely. it said, uh, you know, you're no longer exempt. Yeah. If you were in, in undergraduate law school, yeah. you were exempt. If you were in graduate law school, you were not exempt ah, unless you were married. You had yeah. to be married. I wasn't married. Um, so I got this draft notice, and I said, gee, this is, this is something I have to act on. And uh, I made a decision. You know, one, one morning I made a decision. It was probably the most important decision of my life, actually. I looked at this letter. I said, I can't let this happen by itself. I have got to intervene. Uh, so... So I, uh, I, I cut classes. Uh, I walked down to the Battery at Lower Manhattan. I looked for a recruiting station, uh -huh. any service. I didn't want to be 
drafted into the army to fight in the jungles of Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, already it was known how troublesome an experience that was. And uh, I went to the Navy, I went to the Air Force, no soap. And then I went to the Coast Guard, and the fellow by the name of Ant uh, Artie Johnson was his name. I only met him one time, but yeah. I remember his name. That's to, to show you how Powerful. important this was. Um, he said, the funny thing is, you know, this morning, an hour ago, we got a, a directive from Washington, said we have to recruit a dozen lawyers uh, to be directly commissioned really? into the Coast Guard right now because okay. we're having Vietnam. And uh, you just happen to walk in an hour after this directive comes down. It, it must be some divine inspiration. <laughs> he said, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's establish an interview process and uh -huh. application. For so we did. And like the, this was wartime. Everything happened uh, very quickly. Right. It was all an emergency. So the day after, I was back there again in the custom house is where their office was, uh, overlooking New York Harbor. And, and, um, and I was being interviewed by three senior Coast Guard officers, and we had a very interesting interview. And um, you know, I, I uh, asked them at the end, well, you know, what does it look like? And it's all oh, looks good. OK, all right. Um, like two days after that, if that, maybe less, I get a call from Washington huh. from a guy named Peter Getman, G-E-T-T-M-A-N. Okay? Uh -huh. Remember that name, too. Okay. And he said, you've been accepted. You're going to be a direct commission lawyer in the Coast Guard. <laughs> Immediate. We're, we're gonna, we're, right. We're going to make you a, mm, I think it was Lieutenant J.G. It was I'm pretty remember. good. I passed over the, through the ensign part, and I yeah. was now a Lieutenant J.G. And we're going to commission you immediately. Um, I'm going to send you to Yorktown, Virginia, which was the officer training school in the Coast Guard. Um, and you're going to have two weeks of orientation because you're already commissioned. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and then we're going to send you off to, uh, you know, uh, your duty station. And I said, what do you, what do you, you know, he said, let's talk about your duty station. I said, what, what do you got? He says, well, you go to Cincinnati. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You can go to St. Louis. Uh huh. Or you can go to Honolulu. Oh. I, said, I said, you can stop there. <laughs> that was it. Jay, we got to take a break. But that's terrific. And what impresses me is that you weren't a victim in this process. You weren't just waiting for something to happen. You took some action. Also, I was very we'll, lucky. We'll get back. I knew you were lucky. <laughs> we'll get back. We're going to take a break for a short moment and then return with our show with more of Jay Fidel. Hello, everybody. My name is Walter Kawai. I, uh, I'm your host for our monthly uh, live streaming video uh, entitled Ukulele Songs of Hawaii, where I bring on guests. We enjoy talking story about the music industry here in Hawaii, uh, sometimes going back uh, 50 decades if possible, and uh, always having some good fun talking with entertainers. We're here located at Think Tech Hawaii, downtown Honolulu at the Pioneer Plaza building and uh, in their studios. And so join me next month for ukulele songs of hawaii konnichiwa think tech hawaii ga nihongo de ookuri shiteimasu konnichiwa hawaii host no kunisei ikari desu e mai shu kakushu getsuyoubi e 2 ji kara desu ne nihongo de nihongo de katsuyaku sarete irashitaru hawaii no iroiro na kata o omaneki shite show o guest show o otodoke shiteimasu e zehi goran ninatte kudasai Welcome back, our viewers in Hawaii and the, around the world to elderhood, aging gracefully here at Think Tech Hawaii in Honolulu. We are joined today by Jay Fidel, the CEO and founder and president, present president of Think Tech Hawaii. And we're talking about stories. Joy is a consummate storyteller, and I say he's a consummate story listener. He has that ability to listen to stories from other people that is really quite a gift. But um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you, Jay, is about the stories that informed you about who you are. How did you learn about who you were? What were those stories that you got from childhood, uh, from young adulthood, or, or adolescence and young adulthood, that really kind of empowered you or became a part of your decision-making process? A couple of short vignette sure. stories. When I was a kid, I lived in, in Forest Hills, Queens which was the bedroom community for the United Nations. Ah. So it was very, it was very polyglot. <clears throat> and uh, a buddy of mine, uh, a good buddy of mine, was in the next building in our, in our neighborhood, which was all six-story 
six-story um, apartment houses. On, and just for fun, by the way, a few days ago, I went on Google, Google Earth, yeah. and I went and looked at that building. Did you look at your place? And then I sent, I sent a copy <laughs> of the photographs that I made of that building. You know, you can do that with Google Earth right. to yeah. my brother, and he was equally stunned by how good these buildings look. It's a, Forest Hills is still a very nice neighborhood, Lovely. nice, clean, uh, safe, all that. <clears throat> anyway, my, my buddy uh, down the block was a guy named Jeff Masuda. He was Japanese, and um, it was part of the quality of that neighborhood. It was the polyglot neighborhood. And indeed, you know, New York was becoming more polyglot, but it wasn't completely that way. And I remember, you know, how much I liked him, and I liked the idea of being friendly with a Japanese guy. And, and that, was, that was a story that worth telling you about in this uh -huh. connection. The second story that comes to mind in that regard was uh, when I arrived here in the Coast Guard, I went to Alamoana Beach, and um, <clears throat> I saw for the first time in my life uh, a Hapahali woman here. Ah. She was a teenager, maybe early 20s. She was stunning, stunning. Uh -huh. And I said, well, I never saw that before. She didn't look like Jeff Masuda. Yeah. She looked something in the middle, Hapahali, you know, and I, I figured it out, you know, this had to be both. Uh, you know, Caucasian and Halley, or who knows, but it wasn't pure anything. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, this is, this is the future of the world. Ah. Is what I'm looking at is uh, something special in Hawaii that you don't find anywhere else. And indeed, it was really not very prevalent anywhere else. Um, and we, we, this, this place, Hawaii, will be, will be leading the world in, in Hapahali people, and they are the superhumans of the future. Mm -hmm. Of course, everybody got the word after that, and the fact mm -hmm. is that there's a lot of places you can go that are hapa yeah. but, but at least at that moment in time, it was a message to me, mm -hmm. and I remember how much it endeared uh, the place to me at the time. The third thing about it is uh, cultural. I remember in those days, you know, even though there was a certain amount of resistance to Howley men uh, in uniform, whatever uniform. Give people on, on uh, some of our viewers an understanding of Howley, what oh, Howley uh, means. Caucasian. Um, there, you know, uh, there, there, you know, there was there was a certain uh, what do you want to call it resistance, uh, a certain uh, you know difference, a certain um, animosity, if you will, uh, based on the Massey case and other issues, maybe the overthrow back in 1893, and and that still existed, you know, between Native Hawaiians and 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 the people in the service who were largely Howley, and um, I remember there was you know that was that was visible, but it wasn't. Palpable. In other words, nobody ever said anything or did anything, but you knew that there was a resistance. <clears throat> however, however, I found that the Native Hawaiian people that I ran into, sometimes just literally running into them, uh, were so friendly to me. Mm -hmm. um, it's my winning smile, but, <laughs> but they would invite you out for a beer, they'd, yeah. they'd take you yeah. out, they would want to spend time with yeah. you. Yeah. They were so friendly, it was unbelievable. And it wasn't just them, mm -hmm. Th that was the nature of the state of Hawaii at the time. It's not quite like that anymore, but in mm -hmm. those days, I said, gee whiz, this is a gem, this is, yeah. this is heaven. Yeah. The, the Elysian fields live right here. Yeah. Between the Hapahali women, you know, and these yeah. guys who were so friendly, buy you a beer any time of day. I said, this has got to be where I ultimately make my life. Lovely. And I made my wife. I met her here uh -huh. not too long after I arrived. She's Japanese. Uh -huh. And we've been married 51 years. Yeah. Lovely. Well the, well, the story that you heard was that you're going to be a part of this. Yeah. You're going to be a leader. One more story. Yeah, please. Um, back when, before the Kahala Hilton got to be, have its name, name changed, um, my, my family on the mainland uh, introduced me uh, to a guy named Johnny Apple. He looked just like you, by the way. No kidding. <laughs> really? Johnny Apple was this great big guy, yeah. and he was the chief correspondent of the New York Times, mm. okay? And he, and he could fly around the world, go anywhere he wanted, and write any story he wanted. And that was the benefit of being the chief correspondent of the uh -huh. New York Times. So he said, why don't you come down and meet me at my hotel, which was then the Kahala Hilton before uh -huh. it changed his name. <clears throat> and we sat in, on the lawn there overlooking the water. and. Uh, and we spoke, and I didn't realize that he was interviewing me the way you are. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and he asked me about, you know, how Hawaii had uh, evolved since yeah. I first arrived, just probably 20 years after, afterwards, uh -huh. so uh -huh. that would be in the 70s, I guess. Um, no, the mm, 80s, 80s. Uh -huh. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, he didn't tell me he was interviewing me, but he was the kind of newspaper reporter that doesn't have to write it down, yeah. so I, I couldn't tell. <laughs> 
but at the end, he said to me, you know, your friends from high school are going to be calling you. I said, why? He said, they're going to be reading about you in the New York Times in a few days. I'm going to write this up. Super. And I'm going to be quoting what, what, Super. what you said. <laughs> Johnny Apple had a business card uh -huh. was half the size of an ordinary business card. Uh -huh. in, those, in those days, you didn't do that. It That's was too creative. kooky. But what it said was, Johnny Apple, chief correspondent, New York Times. Simple. <laughs> what kind of a card is that? Simple. <laughs> anyway, I remember it because our conversation was all about what I had learned, what I had seen in the evolution of Hawaii in terms of business, social, a whole polyglot experience, people coming from the mainland, settling in. You know, my, my generation of people trying to find a home here. And that's what, what Johnny and I, I talked about. And indeed, in a few days' time, there was an article in the New York Times, and all my classmates from high school called me. Super. Super. <laughs> well, these stories, these stories come to us. And part of what you're saying is that, the, that fate gives us these stories, gives us the opportunities and openings. In 2012, something occurred for you that changed your life. I mean, around that time, early 20s, early 2000s. And, uh, and and what I'm maintaining is that we can rewrite our stories. People get stuck in their stories sometimes from the past, and well, I have to, I have to do this because that's who I am, and they don't think about that. that that's not who they are. But what about the new story that comes about? And what has been the new story that keeps you so energized in this elderhood stage of your life? I'm, I'm not elder. Oh. I'm still adolescent. Oh, I'm, excuse I'm, me. <laughs> I'm a, a well-nourished 16. <laughs> this is one of the aspects of elderhood is denial. <laughs> so, you know, I, which, from what you said is interesting. Indeed, you know, you, you always have to know what, what, what chapter you're in. Okay. And you have to try to move ahead and have a new chapter. You yeah. can't just stick with it. Um, I know a person who has never left the island of Oahu in her whole life. And she's in her late 40s or early 50s uh -huh. now. Can't do that. Um, you must have new chapters. The question is, is two things. One is what motivates you to get to the next chapter? Right. So easy to get into a, a, a channel, a rut, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and just stay there because it works. And why change it? And a lot of people do that yes. for their whole life. Cradle to grave, the same thing, just as expected. You know, do the, the right thing, the predictable, the predicted thing, <clears throat> or have another chapter. And indeed, I wish I had many chapters to come because yeah. I can find them. I'm telling you now, yeah. ThinkTech has helped me um, identify yeah. things that I would like to do in my life. Yeah. Unfortunately, I have more chapters than I have remaining years, I'm sorry <laughs> to say. The other point I wanted to make is, is, of course, you have to identify new chapters. You really have to do that. But the other thing is sometimes it's hard to move from one to the other. It's hard to conceive of it, you know, how are you going to do this? And then once conceived it, once you conceive of it, it's hard to actually do it. Because it's always, you know, there's a discomfort. Uh, you're, not, you're not in a, a comfortable zone. You, you have to work at it. Um, and in my case, uh, I've, I've been lucky. It's either been fate, such as the letter mm -hmm. uh, from the draft board, uh, or in the case of leaving the practice of law, it was uh, one of the people in my firm said to me, it's time you to consider something else because you're you're evolving to it anyway. And she was she was my my guru and my and my soulmate in that regard, and and she helped me understand uh, uh -huh. how important it was. Yeah. And so without that, without that consultation, mm -hmm. if you will, mm -hmm. I might still be practicing. Honestly, I, I might have I might have lost out on this chapter. Yeah. But luckily, uh, I had that advice. I acted on that advice. I moved to the next chapter. And I found that although it was hard, you know, there was a certain, you know, you had to put in a lot of time and energy and take a certain amount of risk. Uh, I was able to do that and it worked out. And it was, gee, almost 20 years ago. So I'm very happy with this chapter. Right. And I believe everybody ought to see their lives as a, as a, a serial of chapters. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. And, and uh, the fact that there was someone who was there, the fact that you called her your guru, but the fact that there was somebody that could be a third listening eye or a third observer who could stand outside of your, your uh, uh, who was standing outside of your in, internal dialogue that goes on and say, this is what's happening in you. This is what I see. And that is a profound, um, important piece to that transition. Um, that takes a lot of courage to make that transition. 
And it takes a lot of, I think, an awareness that there's something you're leaving in order to move into something that you're creating. Something new. Creating is the operative word. I'm so glad you used creating. that word. I was going to use that word, too. Good. Uh, you know, the, the, the magic of any chapter is you... It's like there was a movie on last night about... Uh, I, I really enjoyed this movie. Uh, it was about Herbert uh, Hoover, the president, uh -huh. who served from 1928 to 1932. Uh, and he was followed by FDR. And mm -hmm. in both cases, both Hoover and FDR, there were a lot of challenges. And when they got in, they didn't know exactly... Maybe this is every president. Uh, they didn't know exactly what they were going to do. They had some, you know, general ideas, but you never know until you're there on the scene, on the yeah. spot, faced with that identity, that situation, before you can create a chapter. Uh, FDR, of course, created a chapter that was yeah, right. a much better chapter than what, what Hoover created. Mm. Um, but the point is that he didn't know Hoover, neither Hoover nor FDR. FDR did not know what the New Deal was going to look like until he got into it and tested this and tested that. And his genius, if you want to yeah. find genius in yeah. him, is he had the ability to listen to people. A brain trust. Excellent. And everyone needs a brain trust. I had my guru in the law firm. Mm -hmm. You need a brain trust to, to do the creative things that, that let you flower out mm -hmm. into that new chapter. Uh, very hard to do it alone. Some people have the talent. Other ordinary human beings, they need to have a brain trust. And so that's the way it worked. It was creativity which is what really gets yeah. me off. Yeah. And it's dealing with a brain trust that helps you massage the creativity. That's beautiful. And when we get to elderhood, and you'll find this once you get there, it's, <laughs> Thank it's, you. it's more difficult to identify that brain trust because people start falling away. They start, you start isolating in some ways. I've thought about how many people have come to this island and come to the, this state of Hawaii who back in their 40s, 50s, 40s especially said, man, my dream is to retire in Hawaii. And you come to Hawaii and you leave everything behind, people behind, and you have to establish a new brain trust, so to speak. And it takes some activity and some intentionality about it. But I love what you're saying about having those, that dialogue, that capacity to, to uh, engage people and have them feed what you already have as a vision. Of all the elements that we've mentioned, brain trust, mission, vision, uh, story of uh, passion and possibility. What's been one of the most important elements for you? A lesson, which I'm still learning. Always trying to learn. Always, always learning. Always, always. Um, is that, it's, you know this, it's all on the record. Everything is on the, your life is on the record. That's true. And you've got to build it the best way you can. Yeah. And it has to be integrated from day one, the time you can first remember, till the time you drop dead. It's yours. It's exclusively yours. Even if you screw up, it's, it's exclusively yours. yours. Yeah. You're writing a unique story or a combination of stories. And you've got to see it um, you know, as having the value of being Yours. Yes. Isn't it a wonderful thing to own your life? That's beautiful, Jay. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us on Elderhood, Aging Gracefully with Jay, Jay Fidel and his great insights. Um, come back next week, next Friday, 2 o'clock Hawaii time, and we'll look at some more stories and what's the importance of stories and sorting those out. Thank you all for joining us. Aloha.